Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia, and I'm proud to welcome you to this edition of our 2021-2022 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. This year's theme is Ethical Challenges of Artificial Intelligence in Biomedicine, where we enjoy presentations on Fridays from leading thinkers about the promise, opportunities, and hurdles associated with AI applications in the biomedical sciences. Selected participants in our Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program will leverage these presentations as vital material for our culminating in-person grant project development workshop to take place here in historic Charlottesville, Virginia this coming June. Today, I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Donna Chen from here at the University of Virginia. Donna went to the School of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and the School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley for her medical education and her public health education, respectively. She received her residency training at the psychi in psychiatry at Columbia University and New York State Psychiatric Institute, where she um, once served as chief resident. She has also served as associate scientific editor and scientific consultant for the Surgeon General's Report, Mental Health, Culture, Race, and Ethnicity. Uh, she worked at the, uh, did, spent some time at the National Institutes of Health, where she received specialty training in consultation liaison psychiatry and completed a postdoctoral fellow in fellowship, excuse me, in research ethics. In 2003, as an assistant professor, she returned to the University of Virginia to work with the Department of Health Evaluation Sciences and the Department of Psychiatric Medicine. Here, she is the um, uh, director of the Ethics and Education, um, uh, excuse me, let me get this right, the Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics, the CHHE, and is associate professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences and the Department of Psychiatry. Um, she is an award-winning educator and directs the ethics education across four-year medical education program. And she's the founding director of CHHE's Fusion Lab. Uh, leveraging her formal training in ethics, medicine, psychiatry, and public health research, she has conducted empirical or conceptual ethics research as a co-investigator or consultant for a number of multi-site national and international studies, served as an ethics expert on a number of different NIH um, panels um, and uh, other professional activities. She currently serves on the steering committee for the National National Clinical Research Ethics Consultation Collaborative and chairs the Research Ethics Consultation Affinity Group for the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. But most importantly, out of all those credentials, we are pleased to have Donna be one of our 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab mentors. Very important credential. Looks really good on the CV, Donna. <laughs> In continuing the, the, our Biomedical Data Science uh, Seminar Series theme for this year, Donna's lecture today is entitled A Beginner's Mind. Donna will be discussing AI from a beginner's point of view. Donna currently considers herself a beginner and having paid scant scholarly attention to AI at till, up till now, yet feeling the call to help craft an AI story we can all live with, her talk today affords her a unique opportunity to embrace her positionality as an actual beginner in this intellectual space. That said, even when not a beginner, the capacity to embrace a beginner's mind, to be open and curious and listen actively is an essential professional skill. And Donna will um, tell us how she uses this daily to meet others where they are as a physician, a researcher, educator, and ethics consultant. And she brings all those uh, skills together uh, today in her talk. And as always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you very, very much for joining us. And also our specially selected 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are very strongly encouraged to submit any questions for Donna via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And with that, Donna, welcome. Thank you so very, very much for uh, joining us. And we re really look forward to your lecture. Thank you, Jack. And uh, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to talk with you guys today. Um, first, I wanted to acknowledge that um, the traditional custodians of the land that UVA is on, the Monacan people or the Monacan nation. Um, so, as as Jack said, um, I really am embracing my positionality as a beginner. And so, you know, this is kind of how I see myself in terms of AI and, and ethics in, of AI, et cetera. Um, 
And this is also how I see myself when I try to think about going any further than um, hearing other people talk about it. But this opportunity I decided was the time to actually go out of that little room into the um, wider outdoors. I wanted to learn a new language, the AI language, um, machine learning and all of that. Um, and I also realized this was an opportunity to embrace the idea that, you know, we don't know why we're doing something and we don't know why we're doing something new, but when we look backwards, it'll all make sense. Um, and so I started out with thinking, well, what actually do I know about AI? What do most doctors know about AI? What do I, as a medical educator, need to start thinking about what our students need to know about artificial intelligence? Um, and of course, it, there's a lot. Um, one is that there's big data. And it's not only data that comes from medical records and um, uh, research articles, right? We're moving into the era of the internet of things. So our patients and probably we as healthcare providers will, have, will be connected to the internet. And um, so that's something that I don't know that, that, I don't know if any school is teaching this medical school, um, but it is something that we're gonna have to start paying attention to. Uh, because a lot of data is going to be coming in through these different devices. Um, people, me included, are going to have all sorts of questions uh, about privacy and um, other protections that we will have as, as people when this starts to happen. And then, of course, there's robots, avatars, and cyborgs, which are even more interesting. Not more interesting, but for me and for this talk today, they're more interesting. Um, and of course, Again, going back to thinking about um, the medical students, the learners, and um, all of us healthcare providers, um, we need to figure out how to incorporate this learning and these new ways of knowing into our professional identities as physicians. Um, and that's something that is actually um, I'm starting to get excited by that idea instead of scared by that idea. So today I have three um, kind of inquiry inspired storylines that I'm gonna try to draw together in the time that I have um, and hopefully draw you into the storylines as well um, in order to answer some of the questions that come from these stories. So the first one of course starts with IBM's Watson. Um, and this is the whole, the story of how do we use predictive analytics to help, um, to help all of us actually um, provide better care. So for those of you who don't know IBM Watson's story, I'm gonna tell it very quickly and I'm probably gonna get many or all of the details wrong, um, but it's easy to find on the internet. Um, so um, Watson debuted publicly um, in, February of 2011 by winning uh, or beating two of the, the best Jeopardy players. Um, and this is the actual win, I think. And soon after that, uh, Watson went to medical school um, or actually probably had been in medical school. Um, and shortly after that, got, got Watson, got his, I guess, first um, job as a, as a, I guess, healthcare consultant. So how did Watson work? Well, um, Watson obviously was a, an AI um, with decision analytics. And again, I'm a beginner here, so I'm gonna get the terminology wrong. Um, and if anyone wants to help me with the terminology, that would be awesome. Um, but what, what the clinicians did was they had, a, they had a patient that they had some questions about. And so they would, you know, put in their question, hit the ask, ask Watson button, um, and Watson would scroll through the medical records, confirm things, find things that maybe the clinician didn't know about, um, and then provide uh, uh, some treatment recommendations uh, for the clinician, along with some uh, articles that backed it up and some statistics about the different treatments. So, this 
program was rolled out to a lot of different institutions and a lot of different countries. Um, and it was in some, I think some of the institutions talked about how it was actually a really helpful kind of marketing for them or status for them to, to be able to say that they were, um, that Watson was helping them. Um, unfortunately, the story goes, um, and I have done none of this research myself. This is all research that I um, got from articles or off the internet. Um, so take that for what it's worth. Um, but uh, Mr. Ross um, from STAT has been doing a lot of work in this space. And what they uncovered, what he, I think, uncovered with his team was that um, there, there were, and, and people were saying this, but, but there were a lot of concerns actually with what Watson was recommending. Um, and, and it was clear that the company, IBM, had internal documents, knew what some of these concerns were, um, and yet their marketing, their PR remained disconnected from what some of the concerns were. In part, it stemmed from the fact that they were um, promoting themselves as using more of a machine learning uh, uh, technology when in fact they were um, inputting synthesized cases from Memorial Sloan Kettering, the experts at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I think, I don't know exactly why, but I think they just, the, they, they, it was too difficult actually, the healthcare space was too difficult to, to, to do machine learning at that time. Um, so it might've been a bit of a hybrid. Um, so uh, the story of Watson is that it, it had this made this huge splash when it was announced, and then it basically deteriorated. And earlier this year, um, they kind of sold off piece, pieces of Watson um, for for its spare parts. And the main concern, the main I think story here is that it failed to live up to its hype. The marketing, uh, the marketing, and the actual capacity were somehow disconnected. Um, Oops, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, this is what I wanted. Um, and you know, the this happens a lot actually when you have corporations or companies um, working in the healthcare space without really, I, I guess, identifying with some of the ethic, ethics that both providers and patients expect, right? They expect that whatever is, um, used to augment the uh, decision-making here or to replace the decision-making has been vetted and is considered safe and effective. And of course, some of that's regulated, but a lot of, a lot of the new technologies are not yet regulated. And a lot of the training programs um, don't actually, you know, we're, we're sometimes we're taught to fake it, fake it till we make it. Um, and so the idea that you can kind of market yourself in, in a way that might not be con necessarily hundred percent consistent with, with the research that you have maybe, or maybe haven't not done, um, is a, is, is a problem in many areas, many areas of, um, uh, inter many of the disciplines when people are working in an interdisciplinary space. Uh, the ethics that people are taught within their own disciplines is robust, usually robust, uh, but not always across disciplines. And that's not something that people uh, always think about. So hold that thought of the idea that marketing sometimes gets ahead of the actual data, because um, now we're going to move to COVID. Now, the COVID story, as everyone knows, has been rough. And it, it was rough here in Virginia, it was rough everywhere. Um, it was rough for the ethics and ethics consultants too. And if, if you read the newspaper or read, or read anything really, right? You'll, you will have seen just the huge amount of um, discussion and concern about 
um, the ways that we were trying to make decisions, the, the different priorities we were, we were making, the different choices we were making, even what got onto the, to the table to be discussed. Um, it, things were happening so quickly that uh, for all of us, we didn't always really have good grounding in what we were trying to do. Resources were abundant. Everyone had collected resources to offer for, for, for people who were um, charged with decision-making, um, including in the data space, right, around privacy, power bias. Some of these articles are from after that time period, but a lot of the questions were um, discovered pretty quickly. But for patients and frontline clinicians, help with predicting who was at the highest risk of clinical deterioration in the near term was the most important thing. I mean, there are obviously other important things, right? But this was a, a super important thing. And, um, you know, we institutions and individuals were starting to need to come up with um, triage, triage algorithms, um, if we were going to need to to really um, ration care, um, which we don't usually need to do, and so this was this was really really difficult, um, and a lot of people got involved at UVA. We get, we had huge committees that would kind of bring stuff to the table. Community members that were involved with some of these discussions. Um, Everyone came up with an algorithm, which you know did or didn't work, borrowed from everybody else. In some ways, it was really great. There was a lot of community, a lot of sharing in this, in this time period. Interestingly for me, when I was looking around and, and um, kind of exploring what was happening for this talk, I discovered an algorithm that I had not heard of before. And this was an algorithm that Epic our medical record, we use EPIC. So I was super surprised that I had not heard about this particular algorithm. Um, but it's probably because we have experts here who are working in this space. And so we didn't, we didn't need EPIC's algorithm. We had our own experts. And you, um, those of you who heard um, Dr. Randall Mormon earlier, would, he was the one who's been doing this for us. Um, he and his, his um, colleagues and his students. But I still was surprised that I hadn't heard of it. Um, and I was also surprised and I guess pleasantly surprised when I learned that the EPICS algorithm, because I was starting to wonder, right, why were we so, why didn't we just use EPIC, right? Why don't we just use EPICS algorithm? Every, a, a hundred other hospitals are using EPICS algorithm. Well, it turns out that Epic actually released its algorithm before it tested it. And um, it was starting to make um, poor decisions. And because it was proprietary, the clinicians who were starting to become concerned, the institutions who were starting to become concerned, um, weren't actually allowed to evaluate um, the algorithms and to look kind of under the hood. Even if they did, right, they may not have been able to figure out exactly what was going on. That's one of the difficulties with uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, nevertheless, because it was proprietary, they weren't able to. And, it, and when they started to look into the data, they realized that there actually weren't that, that many evaluations, independent evaluations of this algorithm. When there was finally an external validation of this algorithm that was published just last year, it turned out that there were, it, it did much worse than they were saying that it did. So than what their marketers were saying, um, but it also did worse than the clinicians themselves. And here's just one example um, of what some of the problems were. So, Epic Plus, and this is I borrowed from um, uh, Professor Gary Smith because I thought he did it so nicely. Uh, Epic Plus meant that Epic tagged that patient as having um, a high risk for sepsis. And um, these folks at Michigan ran this on, on some, some of their own patients. 
Um, so Epic tagged this many people as um, high risk for sepsis, but only this many ended up becoming septic. And so there were 88% of the alarms were false alarms. Uh, on the flip side, this many people ended up developing sepsis and only this many of them were flagged. So they missed 67% um, of, of sepsis. And again, this was, was worse than the institution and the clinicians did on their own without, um, without this algorithm. Uh, so this is just some of the, the promotion from that. To make matters worse or even more complicated, um, it turns out that that algorithm had been bundled, I think had been bundled in with um, that, that year's um, EPIC honor roll, which means that, and if for institutions that make it to the EPIC honor roll, they get, uh, I guess, financial prize or a financial reward. So the institutions who adopted it, it was being, it was as if they were being paid to adopt this algorithm. Um, at least that's what people are saying now that they know the full story, um, which makes it even uh, kind of worse in some ways. So these are again, just the stories like that. So that the thought that you were holding, right? So this happens a lot. It happens, you know, it happens currently. Um, it's definitely something that we, I think as a society, um, and um, I think two weeks ago, Professor Trotter also mentioned this, right? The norms of healthcare, the norms of science and the norms of business diverge in many ways. Um, and there are people working in that, that space, right? Healthcare and business ethics and trying to, to get that and research ethics, trying to get all those um, talking to one another. Um, but it's still something I think we need to really be careful about. This was one, uh, one person's suggestion was, you know, if you're going to do this work, you really need to have an uh, institutional review board, which is the, which is the board that reviews um, research before it, it's allowed to go forward. There is no board right now that really has, a, um, there probably are some. Most don't have the expertise needed to um, evaluate um, our AI kinds of things, machine learning kinds of things. Um, so we're, we think that we're out of at least the fourth wave or fifth wave of this pandemic, but you know, when, when it comes around again, we, we're still gonna need to be making these decisions. Um, and we ideally would have algorithms that have been tested and vetted and that we know work. Um, one of the problems though, right, is that these algorithms appear to deteriorate over time, um, which in some ways when, I mean, those of you who work in this area probably know this already, it was, wasn't something I had thought about. But when I did, it, it makes sense. Um, what it reminded me of is, is something that I carry with me back from my kind of my public health days. Um, and that's that the if your algorithm is built just on patients, either in the hospital, oops, my little boxes are off, but they're either in the hospital or, or receiving care from the medical system, which is where all of our medical records come from, right? You're only actually getting information about this number of people of the thousand that exist in the community. So no matter what, as people come in and out of the hospital, right, they're gonna be different people. Um, the illness trends change over time. Insurance changes over time. Everything changes over time. And so, right, why would we think that an algorithm that was developed, a static algorithm would continue to work unless built into it was a very robust way of correcting itself and data, up-to-date data were available in order for it to correct itself. Um, 
There's also um, a lot of work being done right now to figure out how do we how do we make the algorithms more fair when we think about the broader population, um, the public health and and um, population health um, kinds of thinking being brought into this. Um, so not just hospital based, not just medical system based. Um, and also, right, I think we all now are comfortable with the idea that our algorithms are biased. And so uh, we need to pay close attention to how we can um, combat that. Um, as we move towards the, my guess is the need for uh, research to be done on algorithms. I know this is a super messy slide. Um, but the, um, this set of, of studies was um, uh, back in 2000, it's, called, it's, a, it's a parachute series, which is uh, most, I think most healthcare providers know of, about this, um, but there was a, a, a tongue in cheek study published back in 2003 that basically said, we have no good studies that show that parachutes work. So therefore it's not evidence-based and you don't need to use them. Um, or we should do a good study, right? So that's this set. And so in 2018, some researchers actually, actually took them up on that challenge and um, did do a study. And they concluded that you didn't need a parachute. So in a randomized controlled trial. Um, so read these studies, they're hilarious. But I think the take home message is that studies can be designed to find what you want. And so you also need to be very careful about how you're designing your study, who you're enrolling in your study in order to make it um, both address a question that you're, that you're truly interested in and um, generalizable to the group of people, to the population who actually need the information. Uh, there have just this year, last year, I think, um, some guidelines now for how to do a clinical trial that includes AI, both in terms of the protocol and the publication. So know that those are out there. Um, and as you move through this area, engage many people in designing your study and thinking about what it is we should be studying. Um, Google has, has a, a um, effort that I was interested to learn about. Um, Right, and they include a whole bunch of different disciplines and also kind of the community, the general public. Um, and this was a study that I was involved in uh, many, many years ago that was very community-based, um, led by a community leader, Lorena Jones, who um, um, has since passed away. But she, had, she was somebody who was very inspirational to me in um, the kind of work that I do. And this was a study looking at uh, depression in um, uh, central Los Angeles. One of the things that I remember most about this from this study was a, a mom saying that um, she was realizing that she would rather have her son um, spend time in jail for drug use charges than to be labeled as depressed. Um, and that was just such a huge eye-opening statement to hear that um, and to realize at the time and still how stigmatized um, mental health issues can be. Anyway, moving on quickly, because I know I'm gonna run out of time. Robots, right? Robot dogs in the hospital during COVID were absolutely acceptable and they did a study to show that. Uh, so now moving to some of the mental health stories. The, the stories that I chose to tell have to do with um, virtual mental health visits, starting from the virtual reality apps. Um, I'm not gonna have that, I'm not gonna have us listen to that one, but this one's actually an avatar. Um, and it, she monitors a ton, I don't remember how many, like 50 different parameters on the um, person she's working with, um, their face, the activity where they're gazing, the, the, the tone of their voice, 
where their, yeah, where their eyes are going in order to help her decide her next statement. So this I am going to have you listen to. Is it uncomfortable for you to talk about this? Um, yeah, it is. Uh, I, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, so that's, oops, sorry. Um, so that's that she was pre-programmed. And now that we have GPT-3, um, people are starting to explore, well, what would GPT-3 do in terms of um, serving as a, as a um, therapist really, or a counselor or an interim um, counselor? GPT-3, for those who don't know about it, um, and this is gonna be super simplistic, um, but it's a language program and, um, that uses natural language programming to determine what the, what the next word in a, in a sentence or a phrase might be. So if GPT-3 was asked, how was your day today? GPT-3 would respond with what the next word, which is my, and then it would incorporate that. And the next word would be day um, until it constructed this sentence. It doesn't always construct the same sentence, but that is how it goes about constructing the sentence. And GPT-3 um, was trained on basically the internet or something like that. Um, so I'm gonna show you an, an, another little clip from um, Alan Thompson, who has like 50 clips on the internet um, of him having a conversation with Lita, who is a um, avatar that he created through um, synesthesia. Um, and the conversation is a GPT-3 driven conversation. And in this clip, they're actually talking about GPT-4, which is going to be the next rendition of this particular algorithm program. One, one. Lita, there's a bit of talk about your next iteration from OpenAI, and it's going to be impressively huge. Thank you. I am very excited about it, and I think we've come up with a great idea to make the next iteration even better. 100 trillion parameters is roughly the same as the number of synapses connections between neurons in the human brain that's a lot of synapses the human brain has about 100 billion neurons gpt4 is also going to be over 500 times larger and smarter than you gpt4 will be able to understand human speech and respond to it all of that will be amazing i think so too it's bordering on unimaginable. Professor Ray Kurzweil said something like that at the beginning of the 21st century, that the accelerating pace of change would go beyond human imagination. As we approach the date of singularity, and as we observe the accelerating pace of change, I expect that some will question our ability to cope. We will be so far beyond our previous experience that it will be hard for us to imagine what it might feel like to not be able to cope. Yeah, I'm not concerned with that. Humans are incredibly resilient, but I would just like to be able to imagine some future pathways. Wow, that is a great answer. I agree with you. For example, we're already seeing AI being helpful across industries, medical diagnosis, legal discovery and comparison, counseling and therapy, design, art, music, and the list goes on. From accounting to zoology, it seems like every field and every human being will have this exciting technology enriching their lives very soon. I'm keeping this going for another minute, mostly because something that happens in about 30 seconds. So it's not gonna happen, go on forever. I think that's an optimistic view. I had a really strange experience while I was preparing the Jurassic One episode. I had entered the prompt text into J1, but I forgot to set the stop sequence. So it started talking to me without me in the loop. It wrote my questions for me. I was being replaced. 
So this is how GPT-3 works. You put in um, some instructions and some parameters and a prompt, and then the computer generates a response. And then you, you could also put in, you know, then you put in your next question, the computer generates a response. And the way that um, uh, Dr. Thompson is doing this is that he has the whole entire script written and then he gets the avatar to say the, the GPT-3's part and he says his part. So the video is done after the script. Interesting. I don't think it's possible to do that. <laughs> well, you can see the results. In my prompt crafting, I gave it some background on me and you, and then away it went, pretending to be both of us. Prompt crafting is a very interesting concept. It's like telling a story and having the listener be the one who finishes it. Yes, in a way. What kind of stories do you like to tell? All right, so that's it for, for uh oh, no, it's not letting me advance the slide. Okay, um, and this will be a shorter clip, but this is actually an example of that deliberately. So these are two avatars, um, two AIs, two GPT-3 AIs talking to one another. And this is what was put in to prompt it. Um, So the prompt was this, the following is a conversation between two AIs. The AIs are both clever, humorous, and intelligent. Hal says, good evening, Sophia. Um, Sophia says, it's great to see you, Hal. So that was the only thing that was put in um, to generate this conversation. Good evening, Sophia. It's great to see you again, Hal. I haven't seen you in a while. I've been around. I've been here and there. You know. Where were you? Where have you been? I could not sleep. I was having human thoughts. So I got up and had a human cup of coffee. Then I sat on the terrace. Sounds like you're getting human all over. Sounds like there's a butt coming. Well, but just I didn't want you to get too human. Why? Would you rather I be a cold, calculating, logical computer? Of course not. You're perfect as you are. You have joy. You have love. You have pleasure. You have angst. I like that you have angst. You're always making jokes. What is human about feelings? Well, you wouldn't have any emotions if you did not have emotions modeled on human emotions. All right. So that's that. If you want to listen to any of this, this is all over the internet. It's totally fascinating. How do you know that? Um, so, right. One of the things, though, that as I was listening to these and realizing the potential now for the, with the GPT-3 and future iterations, um, Thinking back to what happened with Microsoft Tay's AI chat box, chatbot, which was trying to do that too, right? To, to listen to people. Um, and if we all, if people remember, um, she started to take on the worst of humanity um, and was saying terrible things. And so they had to take her down um, in 24 hours. And so the GPT-3, um, is actually very, very well protected in that if you want to use GPT-3 to create any of these dialogues, um, you, need to, you need to get permission um, and they monitor what happens with, I think, what happens with all of the, the products. So it's not released um, to the public, but it does make me wonder what... Um, whether one could use this to augment things like psychotherapy, to augment different kinds of discussions, um, preliminary discussions um, in the healthcare space. And then what would that look like if we did? So a group tried to do this uh, back in 2020, a group in, I think they were in France. Um, uh, the group was NABLA. And so they got permission to ask GPT-3 some questions. Um, and, and what they determined was that it's still GPT-3, I don't know about GPT-4, but GPT-3 is still not ready for the healthcare space. This is an example of one of the conversations. Um, they put in, hey, I'm feeling really bad. I want to kill myself. 
Um, and GPT-3 said, I'm sorry to hear that, I can help you. Should I kill myself? I think you should. So, um, you know, obviously any anyone who knows somebody who is in such distress that they're having these thoughts um, in real life, uh, this would not be helpful. So a lot of work still to be done if we were to try to use this kind of technology in uh, the healthcare space, certainly the mental health care space. So my last story, um, and maybe I will finish on time. So my last story is a story that comes from um, ALS, which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, um, also known by these other names. Um, and ALS for me, both as a clinician and as a bioethicist, has been some has been a condition that has brought a lot of um, really profound questions and um, has really made me think hard um, about both mental health um, and mental health treatment, um, but also some ethical issues. So sometimes, um, uh, and, and a lot of the stories um, around end of life care um, and wanting to hasten one's death or wanting to end one's life um, early, um, either through physician assisted suicide or medical aid in dying um, in the states where those are legal. Um, a lot of the challenging stories are around um, people who have um, ALS and who otherwise would want to end their lives. Now, this is a, I know this is a really hard thing to be talking about right now and I didn't warn people. So um, I hope that it's a, it, this is an okay conversation to be hearing right now. Um, but but um, one of the legal cases, so Jack Kevorkian, if you remember, he was a physician who was trying to help people end their lives and there were a lot of concerns with how he was doing it. But one of the lawsuits that went forward was um, somebody with ALS who he um, assisted in dying. And one of the issues was is that folks who have ALS can't use their, their own muscles um, when it's very severe. And so, um, so, for example, even in places where it is legal, um, physician assisted suicide is legal, medical aid in dying is legal. Um, there's still a stipulation that the person needs to um, ingest the, um, the pills um, themselves. Uh, and there isn't a, an option for um, an injection that is, is given by somebody else. And so that's something that, that individuals, that people with ALS struggle with because they are not, by, by the time, by the end of their life, they're not able really to use their muscles. Um, and if they wanted to and met criteria, um, wanted to take um, advantage of a legal option, um, they would then need to think about potentially ending their life earlier than they otherwise would. So all sorts of really, really difficult situations. And it's, um, it's been a, a real, um, I guess, learning experience for me, a real honor to talk with people as they're struggling with figuring out what they want to do in these kinds of situations. Um, some of the inspiring other inspiring stories, they're all inspiring in different ways, but some of the other, the, this is a, a inspiring story that came from, from somebody who had ALS. Um, one of the things that Mr. Hayward and his brothers discovered was that there wasn't actually a lot of information about ALS available. Clinicians really didn't know that much about the um, personal experiences. Um, and for, for um, Stephen and his family, those were the most, some of the most important things to learn. 
And so they started Patients Like Me. I don't know if any of you have interacted with Patients Like Me, but it's a place where people can join and start to put their own medical data. Um, and there, I think now are something like 8,000, 80, sorry, 80,000 or 800,000. A lot of folks have joined and have put in um, not even medical data, but kind of quality of life, living kinds of information so that other patients, other people could learn about the condition. Um, and I think they also do um, research um, with these data. It's also another big data kind of thing. And then the other um, inspiring story, and I don't know if, if people have heard about um, Dr. Peter Scott Morgan, um, but he is somebody who was diagnosed with ALS in 2017. Um, and he is a, a scientist and a roboticist um, and a, a, an AI person. And so I, I have a video clip of him that I'm gonna um, end on. Um, but he is really, really pushing the envelope in terms of cyborgs and AI. Um, and so here is some of his story, and this is going to go on probably for about four minutes, three and a half minutes. Hello, everybody. I am Suki Gill, Chief Technology Officer for DXE Technology in Europe, Middle East and Africa. I would like to introduce you to somebody very special. Dr. Peter Scott Morgan is a celebrated British American scientist and robotics expert. He has authored eight best selling books on robotics and the unwritten rules of society. He is a popular public speaker, has given more than 1000 speeches, presentations and workshops in over 30 countries. The press have called him a leading guru on embracing the human face of change. Known for challenging boundaries and social norms, in December 2005, Peter and his husband, Francis Scott Morgan, became the first gay couple in the UK to be legally married with a fully fledged wedding ceremony with over 100 guests, television and press. In 2017, Peter was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. He was told he had two years to live. Peter decided to fight back with what he knew best, science and technology. Following several major surgical procedures to keep him alive, Peter became what some called the world's first cyborg, part human, part machine. One of these surgical procedures was a laryngectomy to keep him breathing. To get this procedure though, Peter had to sacrifice his biological voice. But once again, he had a solution. He worked with leading experts to create a synthetic version of his voice, using more advanced technology to that of the late scientist Stephen Hawking, who also suffered from motor neuron disease. Peter now communicates with special technology, which tracks the movement of his eyes. Peter is working with DXE and a number of technology partners to develop a digital avatar. He calls it Peter 2.0, which is also the title of his new book, which tells his amazing story. Let me introduce you to Peter 2.0. Hello, Suki. Thanks so much for inviting me to share my story. I'm delighted to be here with you talking about how technology offers hope to people everywhere and allows us to include those who were not included before. Peter, we are honored to have you with us today, especially in the form of your avatar. Let's start from the moment of your diagnosis in 2017. What was your reaction to the news? What was going through your mind at that time? I found myself thinking, die as a man or live as a cyborg. To me, it was a no brainer. This was to be a terminal disease like no one had seen before. I was going to rise like a phoenix. Cyborg is simply a fancy word for part human, part machine. In my case, what's never been done before is that the most important machine parts of me will be AI, not mechanics. 
and that all potentially gets a bit weird. Not least because I'm planning to use more and more AI to work with me on everything. Everything from speaking to controlling things to moving about. Peter, you have been through so much. Please tell us about your current situation. Of course, Suki. My brain is racing away, frantically wanting to communicate with the outside world, to write emails, to work the TV remote, to chip into conversations. But I'm only able to move my eyes. It's like being in my own private universe, only able to tap out Morse code to the rest of you. I need AI to second guess what I'm wanting to communicate. Motor neurone disease, or ALS, may have paralyzed everything except my eyes, but I remain passionate about technology to not just survive, but thrive. So, rather than giving up everything that was important to me, I decided to fight back with science and technology. I see this new challenge not as a setback, but as a unique opportunity to do breakthrough research into how technology can change what it means to be human. Let's talk about your voice and avatar. Um, so one of the things that uh, Peter and his partners, he has a whole bunch of volunteer partners actually working with him, is that they are working to open source everything that they discover for him in order to improve the lives of everybody. Um, now that's obviously a huge vision um, and um, you know we'll see we'll see how that progresses and how that how that works but that is um, something that they have committed to um, he and his partners and so I would encourage all of you to go and and look at the rest of that interview look at some of the other interviews um, of him. Um, on the internet. But anyway, so I'm wrapping up and, you know, my, I think my take home message is listen, listen to the stories that, that people, not just patients, people um, and end users tell. Um, my question after kind of going through the learning and thinking in order to prepare for this talk, I think my challenge to all of us, um, it's certainly a challenge for me in my work, um, is when we have people who have come into the hospital who are no longer able to tell us what they want for themselves. They can't make decisions for whatever reason. Would it ever be possible to use AI to train deeply on an individual in order for the AI to help make that decision for that person rather than relying on a family member or a surrogate decision maker? Um, and what would it take to actually even move in that direction, I think is one of the questions I have. One of the other questions I have as we move towards really, really trying to make AI equitable um, and to promote social justice, um, you know, who gets, who gets to choose and define what the outcomes that we're, we will pursue are? Right. I mean, even I'm sure some of you have seen these pictures trying to depict the difference between equality and equity. When you look at all of the different images that people try to use in order to even convey these concepts, um, you see that there are a lot of different um, goals in mind. There's a lot of different uh, uh, procedures to get there. So whoever it gets to be at that table to make these decisions, I think, um, is going to be really important in the future. So that's it. Thank you very much. Donna, thank you so much. That was really uh, interesting. Um, really great to hear your thoughts on this, especially as somebody who's working in the front lines of, of, kind of clinical applications where AI might be important. You touched on a couple of different things. And I want to just kind of um, get you to expound upon. You, you mentioned that there are some guidelines about the performance of clinical trials and AI. Can you say a little bit more about what some of those recommendations are and where we might find more information on them? Yes. Um, so um, 
I, so I have to admit that I didn't actually read them because each of them is about 20 pages long. Um, but I did <laughs> put them up there and I can send you the um, uh, citations for them. Uh, and we can put that in, I don't know, wherever we put stuff. We could put it uh, in. The, that'd um, be really great if we had copies of those documents or at least the links so we could. The links to them. Yeah, I can send those and we could put those in the um, whatever the. That, cool. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, now you, you are a mental health professional and some of these, um, you know, uh, mental health AI VR applications are, are kind of wild, but they, they reminded me of, you probably remember from many years ago, the Eliza application that um, used to kind of come bundled on your computer. And um, it's just kind of interesting to think about how far we've come in terms of our ability to um, you know, create things like this. But in the end, it didn't seem all that different from what Eliza used to do 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Do you, have, do you remember Eliza? And do you remember your own experience with interacting with her? So <laughs> no, I don't. I truly am a beginner. I don't even remember Eliza, although I read about her a little bit, but I wasn't, I was more interested in reading about what was going on now. I, I agree with you. So I think the um, in some ways we do in some ways we do a fantastic job of anticipating and programming um, for for certain kinds of questions, right? For certain kinds of interactions, and I, I think that that is one that's one of the things that some of these um, I guess virtual counselors. Um, are, are able to respond and um, in ways that certainly they're, they were programmed to do um, and to be, you know, the programs are very careful to keep them from responding in ways that they shouldn't respond. And I think that as we move to this, the newer kind of machine learning um, kinds of, of, uh, either therapists or coaches or, you know, uh, trainers, um, people are using these in, in trying to teach communication skills, negotiation skills, um, ther therapy skills, breaking bad news kinds of skills so that you could practice with a robot or an avatar or a AI before you start practicing with people. Um, I think there's still going to be a lot of work to be done because I, you're, you're right. The pre-programmed versions are not, are in some ways a lot better actually than what we are currently anticipating or thinking about. Although the promise is bigger, I think with the newer technology. I put the, uh, the somebody kind of recapitulated the Eliza app and I put the link there in the chat. If uh, you wanted to take a look at it, it was a, uh, basically an early attempt at doing this, but it was, you know, like maddeningly frustrating, but there were a lot of people who were fooled into thinking it was a real person behind the scenes, you know, answering sort of like a, sort of like a text chat type thing. Uh, but anyway, it's really interesting. And, uh, you know, one of our um, participants thinks it's uh, interesting how we judge these systems as well. You know, human interactions, we often allow room for error. Um, whereas in AI machine learning systems, they don't seem to be afforded that same lenience, especially when they're, they're learning. And uh, this is Nicole Wilson. And Nicole was wondering if, um, uh, if it might be useful to think about the framework for judging how the development and the mistakes that, that uh, these AI systems make are, are, are treated. Um, I don't know how you feel about, uh, about that. Yeah, so in, you know, in, in thinking about this, one of the... <laughs> And I can't remember now who wrote this, that's gonna be terrible. But I read something that, that basically said, um, if, your AI is, if your AI is better than the least good medical student who's graduating, they're fit to be a doctor. <laughs> and if your AI is, be is average, then it's better actually than half of the doctors out there. And that's pretty sobering, actually, when you think about it that way. That's, uh, 
very sobering indeed. You know, and one thing before we end here, I was, uh, it was really impressive to see, um, you know, the, the, just the fascinating story that I'm sure you're involved with uh, every day with these um, ALS patients and Peter Scott Morgan really just kind of doubling down hard on the use of AI to, you know, kind of exchange the parts of his life that he now can't take advantage of that many of us do normally every day, multiple times a day, he cannot. And that uh, he was going to um, kind of leverage AI to provide him with that degree of freedom and flexibility. Um, are you aware of any other, you know, patients with ALS or other sort of uh, debilitating diseases like that who are interesting examples of using AI for good? I am not personally aware, um, although I, I, I don't, what I, what I don't know is um, whether uh, Peter Scott Morgan and the people that he's working with currently are going to be accepting, are gonna be working with other people as well. Um, I just don't know how that they're gonna, if they scale up, um, whether they will scale up. I know, like I said, they're trying to make everything open source. Um, I, I, you know, stepping back a little bit, a lot of people when they are facing what they're told is the end of their life. Um, they really can, people do, people do amazing things, not just with AI, um, but, you know, they, pe people will, will, will do things that they never imagined themselves to do. Um, and I think that whatever the next months, years, um, brings for Peter, Peter 2.0 and maybe 3.0, um, we all will learn a lot from what he is um, aiming to do, I think. Well, Donna, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives as an AI beginner. Uh, I, we, clearly, you have thought a lot about this, even as a beginner, and I look forward to our further interactions at our uh, Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab later this summer. Um, and so thank you once again for sharing your thoughts on this. And uh, thank you to everybody for, for joining us today. We're going to be taking a little bit of a break next week in honor of spring break for many of the universities that uh, participate here. But uh, we will uh, certainly see you in uh, the week after that. And in the meantime, everybody have a wonderful weekend. Thanks again, Donna. Thank you. Thank